So Bill, please take it away. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, so yeah, starting last year, we uh, put on our web page a what we called a San Diego County State Beach Report, and in it we tried to uh, both present the the um, beach change data we had seen in the last year, but also put it in the context of what we have observed in San Diego County uh, over the last 20 years. And uh, so the plan is to continue to provide this annual update through the beach report. Um, but uh, because this is, we consider this sort of our primary way going forward to present uh, our beach monitoring information um, on time scales of seasonal to decades, uh, we thought it would be useful to actually make a guide to the uh, beach report uh, in a story map form, which kind of uh, goes right from the surveys uh, all the way up to the products in the beach report and what's behind them and, and how to interpret them. The idea is that uh, the goal would be uh, that this guide could be used by state park staff as kind of an initial step for them to become familiar with some of the background behind the report and what's in it. Uh, and so it's kind of aimed at a pretty general audience. And uh, so uh, keep that in mind as we go. Uh, very interested in getting feedback from people about how to make it more accessible over time. Uh, so the beach report, just I'm just going to sc scroll through it here for everyone and make some comments about it. I won't dwell too long on uh, some obvious things, but pause on some more interesting areas, I think. Uh, so it's really broken down into five areas. Uh, talk about the survey methods and then the beach change metrics, the parameters we derive from those surveys for the beach report. Uh, and then how we use those in a case study for Carter State Beach where we have a lot of data and it's been an interesting place evolution wise. So kind of step through Cardiff State Beach, uh, some of the main products, and then put Cardiff in the context of the other beaches um, uh, in San Diego County, as well as kind of a, a, a bigger picture of, of what we see in the data uh, over the last two decades. And then finally, that segues into a nice little thing at the end where you can actually, uh, through a, a GIS type map, go and actually look at the beach report for uh, one of the specific beaches in San Diego County. Okay, so the report just begins with survey methods. You've heard about uh, these already from Adam and Julia, um, but this just has a little, just a little nice page thing where you can scroll how horizontally uh, through different, uh, the different ways we uh, make surveys. Here we have the jet ski. And then here's the ATV running along a transect line. Get a feeling with the video here of kind of the pace at which these things are done. And here's Kent having fun doing the push dolly into the swash zone, a really important uh, section of data to collect, very difficult, difficult to collect, but this connects the ATV surveys with the jet ski surveys. And here is our LIDAR truck. Again, here with the video, you kind of get a feeling for the pace that the truck drives while it's collecting data and uh, making its way over cobble berms. And finally, the drone. This can either have a camera on it or LIDAR, uh, our latest and greatest uh, way to measure things. Okay, then scrolling past our surveys, there's just a couple slides to kind of give people a feel for what these uh, survey techniques can produce. This is from the drone. Uh, this is a structure by motion picture. So a 3D picture uh, with color. And this is Torrey Pines North State Beach and uh, a summer and a winter. Julia showed you this sort of thing. Here we have it in slider form. So you can slide back and forth and see how the beach changes from summer to winter with the cobbles appearing as the sand is eroded away. And then, oops, scrolling onward, here we go. 
Yeah, and then the next slide is also talking about the surveys, but this one makes the distinction between what we call the jumbo surveys, the ATV and the Dolly and the jet ski together versus the LIDAR surveys, uh, the truck LIDAR or the dr drone LIDAR or historical airborne LIDAR data that we have in the data set. Uh, so on the right-hand side is, uh, is those, those LIDAR systems uh, and uh, they provide a very dense coverage of the beach but it's subaerial only. And so we still even struggle today with separating the waves from the, from the uh, sand right at the edge. Uh, and then when you slide the other way, now you see these jumbo surveys. And so this is the combination of the ATV and Jolly, Dolly and jet ski. And you can see where I talked about the Dolly kind of connects the two. Sometimes it doesn't quite work out. It's hard to get the Dolly deep enough and the jet ski shallow enough all the time to connect them, but that's the idea. These are typically 100 meters apart. We vary depending on what's going on, uh, but we have this type of data going back to 2001. Okay, so once it's passed through the survey methods, then we go on to talk about the beach change metrics, things that we take from the, from the survey uh, to quantify changes in the beach. And uh, the most common one, the one that most people are familiar with is the beach width. Julie talked about this a little bit. We tend to try to go from the back beach, a back beach that we've identified to the mean sea level uh, contour. This of course varies in time. Um, and when the beach widths we present in the report are averaged in the longshore for the entire beach, um, the truck surveys in particular uh, give a very robust number for that because of their coverage that they provide. In addition to the beach width, we also calculate a beach volume. And so this is the uh, amount of sand we believe is mobile uh, between the back beach and that mean sea level shore, shoreline location. And in order to calculate this, we have to have some sort of uh, bottom. And in this case, we use the lowest elevations we've ever measured. Um, and so the volume that we're estimating is the, um, the known to be mobile volume of sediment. And then finally, the third main parameter we use is the nearshore volume. So this involves using the jet ski surveys as well. Same idea. We have a lowest observed elevation surface based on uh, the historical surveys we have. And then we calculate a volume on top of that. Um, this is by far the most difficult number to get. and uh, the, uh, the least robust because typically our surveys are 100 meters apart. So it requires a fair amount of gridding, but it's extremely valuable number because this is really getting at the core of what the sand supply is for the beach uh, and how that changes over time. All right, so now that we are armed with our three metrics, let's do a little look at Cardiff State Beach as a case study in the beach report. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Cardiff here. This is San Alijo Lagoon in the back. Uh, this is kind of highlight here. This is roughly highlighting the near shore zone out to eight meter water depth. And um, with Cardiff to the north side of Cardiff is Cardiff Reef. And at the south end is uh, Seaside Reef. So it's sort of an interesting place. It's sort of hemmed in a little bit by reefs, but sediment certainly can get past, um, but they are kind of, uh, um, partial barriers to movement of sediment along the coastline. Uh, so there have been two pretty significant nourishments at Cardiff, back with the Sandag uh, Regional uh, Beach Nourishment Number Two, and then more recently the uh, San Alito Lagoon Restoration and the development of a living shoreline dune at Cardiff. Those have brought in significant amount of sediment into this yellow system area. In addition, uh, every, pretty much every year, they dredge the inlet up here and uh, in the spring, and they deposit the sand and shallow water uh, to the south of Cardiff Reef, just to the south of Cardiff Reef out in here, about 20,000 cubic meters per year, roughly 20 to 30,000, I think. But that pretty much happens on an annual basis and has been, don't, been going on for a long time. Okay. 
So one of the plots you'll find in the report uh, for beaches is, and this is sort of the, the shortest time scale we show, is uh, seasonal beach, beach widths when we have them at a beach. And so this is just showing Cardiff's uh, seasonal beach, but beach width since 2002, mostly. You can see one point back in 97, 98 were the earliest LIDAR flights that were flown along the coastline. And so that's sort of the beginning of things, if we can get a decent number there. And you can see that over time, you see the seasonal uh, fluctuation in the beach width, but you'll also see over time that uh, the beach has been getting wider at Cardiff. Scrolling along then, uh, here is the same uh, time plot on the x-axis, but now uh, we're displaying uh, the history of the, the, that nearshore volume number, the one that requires the jet ski um, at Cardiff. That begins in 2007 there, because that's when we started doing uh, intensive jet ski surveys. Uh, the El Nino years uh, in this time period are shown in red. Uh, but you can see, also see from this that over the time period, 2007 till up till now, uh, again, there's also been an upward trend uh, in the uh, total nearshore volume of sediment. Again, this is the known to be mobile sediment based on the lowest observed surface from all the observations that we have taken in the area. Um, so it, uh, yeah, very important number to have if you're gonna to try to understand sediment budgets. All right, and in addition to the near shore volume, we have the beach volume now. So this is the one that goes just out to the mean sea level contour. These are annual numbers uh, that, that we're uh, showing here. Um, now, in this case, you can see that now we have a few more years of data with the beach volume going back to 2002. Because this just requires subaerial information, now we can use air, historical airborne LIDAR as well as the more recent truck LIDAR to do these sorts of things. So there's more data available uh, and uh, more opportunity to do a beach volume. And you will see in the beach report that many of the state beaches here in San Diego County, mostly they only have beach volume numbers because we haven't been there with a jet ski. And so I, I keep adding things to here in the beach report. All of these things are on the plot at once and you kind of have to sort them out. That's kind of the idea behind this little story map is that people can kind of see them added one at a time and you get a better handle on what's going on. Uh, and so this is the beach width numbers. Uh, so now it uses that right-hand y-axis uh, for the beach width in meters. Uh, but you can see that uh, at least at Cardiff that the beach width uh, tracks very kind of nicely with both the, the beach volume and the nearshore volume in, in that, uh, as well uh, over time. So they seem to be mirroring each other for the most part, which is good to know. And again, the beach width has increased considerably, uh, about 25 meters since 2002. And then finally on these plots, uh, when it's available, uh, we show the, the cumulative amount of reported nourishment and bypass sand volume that has been placed uh, at a beach. And so for Cardiff, that's what it looks like here. And so you can see around 2012, this was one of the nourishments. And, uh, and then here, this is the big, the big uh, um, uh, San Leo Lagoon restoration, living shoreline, a little unclear exactly how much of that it ended up directly on the beach. We'll have to figure that out over time, but those where those show up, but also I want you to point out all these tiny little steps going up. And those are those annual bypasses, um, which kind of go without anyone paying much attention and they're put in shallow water. They're not generally put right on the beach itself. So that's all done kind of quietly in the background. But you can see here in this plot that it really adds up over time. Okay. So this is kind of just an interpretive section like of, so people go, okay, so you've made these things, you know, I see the different trends and things like that. Like, is there any other value in them? And we think there is that uh, they can be useful in trying to kind of understand some of the basics of the sediment budget uh, in a particular area like Cardiff. And, uh, and to do that, here's just an illustration uh, looking at the time period from 2007 to 2015, prior to the 2016 El Nino, which kind of shocked the system some for sure. There was a, a loss of sand to the nearshore area. 
Um, but leading up to that time, a nine year time period, you can start to pull out some useful numbers. Uh, and so typical way one might think about budgets is to say, okay, like how much sand has been put into the system over that time period and what happened to it? And so the amount that was put in was about 200,000 cubic meters of sand. So that's the nourishment, there was a nourishment in there plus all these little bypasses. Okay, well, if you kind of do the same thing for the near shore volume on the top, you come up with something like 190,000 cubic meters. So what this seems to be telling us is that um, um, the, sand, the sand volume is remaining in the system. And what I mean by not that is not that there is no sand coming or going from the system because it has open boundaries at both the north and south end as well as offshore. And in fact, we have evidence that sand leaks out down to Solana Beach as well. Um, what we're saying more is that it's, it seems to be acting like a capacitor, that yes, there is sand flow through the system, but the sand that's being added, uh, you know, whatever that sand flow is, is, is not primarily driven by the amount of sand that's in the system at a particular time. And so uh, this sand that's been added uh, has essentially just contributed to the total volume in the system. And so it's acting like a capacitor in that regard. Okay, so this I think is a really interesting number. It's like, okay, I've added the sand, the near shore volume has gone up at that same amount. Oh, but look, if you look at the subaerial beach volume, because now this thing's feeding the whole profile, well, the subaerial volume, the annual amount of it, it's gone off by about half that amount. It's gone up by about 100,000 cubic meters per year. So I think that's a really useful number of like, what's your expectation is when you're putting a certain amount of sand into the system, how much of it is gonna go to just feeding the general profile and how much is gonna actually go to uh, uh, the volume on the subaerial beach the, you know, which is mostly what people care about, uh, you know, from a recreational point of view. And the answer for Cardiff seems to be about half. And then finally, what does this all translate to in terms of the beach width? And over this time period, the beach width expanded by about 15 meters. And so there you go, you can do a quick back of the envelope calculation. And pretty much for every 13,300 cubic meters of sand that was added to the system, they gained about a meter of beach, an annual beach width. Uh, so in terms of people that want to uh, do cost benefit of these sorts of things, I think these are really valuable numbers, as well as looking at one's expectation of adding sand to the system and when, what you expect it to do. Now, is there some limit to this with Cardiff? If, can you just keep adding sand forever um, and it will keep doing this? Who knows? But um, up to this point, it's sort of been taking the sand on, if you will, uh, to the benefit of the beach. Okay, so then, so now we have our little story at Cardiff and we want to put it in a perspective about uh, beaches in general. <laughs> in California, as well as other beaches in San Diego County. And what we found by looking at uh, Cardiff and others is in San Diego County is that um, it's helpful to kind of conceptualize what is happening is uh, beach evolution on, on three different time scales. There's, and here, and so this is gonna, a little series of cartoons that kind of steps through that idea. And, um, so the first is the seasonal time scale, three months to a year. This is what we normally think about. The beaches get wider, they get narrower um, as the seasons uh, progress over time. And every once in a while we have a bad El Nino and the beach really gets narrow. Um, but what we see in the data when we fit trend lines between the El Ninos is uh, something that looks more like this, is that uh, yes, we do have this seasonal signal, but it's really is superimposed on an El Nino cycle signal, uh, which is governed by the, the time between, you know, significant El Ninos that really set the beach back. And that can range from anywhere from two to seven years, but typically or kind of five to seven years is what people normally think of. And so if you imagine now that, yes, so every five to seven years, we have a, a serious El Nino, more storms than usual, bigger storms than usual, the result is that the beach gets quite narrow. Um, but what becomes clear in a lot of the data we have is the beach does not 
recover right away the next summer, that in fact takes multiple years for that beach to come back. And, um, and when we look at uh, where the sediment is offshore over that time period, it looks like it just takes a while for sand that's been deposited, say out in six and seven meters water depth after a really bad El Nino winter, it takes a number of years for it to make it all the way back to the beach. And so, uh, so we see these trends instead. Um, again, uh, the, on top of that is the annual seasonal stuff, which does vary from year to year, even between El Ninos. And so that sort of masks the signal a little bit, but it's in there. And then if you kind of look at how well the beach does on average in those recovery phases and connect those over time, then we start to see these longer term trends that, uh, that we think are more just uh, about the general sand supply in the near shore area, that they start to show up. Again, the, um, the El Nino cycle is now superimposed on these much longer term trends. And now we're starting to get into climate change issues as well as uh, long term uh, variations in sand supply, particularly natural ones uh, that occur to a system. And of course, sea level rise now playing into this, these scenarios. Okay, so this is our kind of our basic story for ways of, of, of a way to look at the data as it comes in. So now if we go back here, and now I'm going to kind of step through the kind of the main summary plot we put in the report, it has a lot of stuff on it, it, has all the beaches on it, last 20 years, it can be a little hard to look at at the beginning. So this is tries to uh, kind of soften things up a little bit and for people to kind of see what's behind it. So we go back to our case study of Cardiff and uh, in our quarterly beach width surveys, which then we turn into annual beach widths, and then we fit trends to them between El Nino's and you get something that looks like this. And you can see that uh, the growth in the beach width at Cardiff and you, with those trend lines, you can put numbers on them. And um, for the last two El Nino cycles, when there has been significant nourishment and the sand bypassing going on, uh, Cardiff has been recovering at about four meters per year after El Nino events. All right, well, how can we put that in context? Well, here we scroll on and now we have a second plot and or a second line on the plot. And this is South Torrey Pine State Beach. And we consider this uh, to be our, like our control natural beach that, um, so this is a section of Torrey Pines below the golf course between Black's Beach and uh, what's called Bathtub Rock. Um, so there's no development there or anything like that. It's not been directly nourished, but it's sort of the end of the literal cell. So it's sort of kind of getting sand, making its way down the coast uh, from to the north. And so it seems to sort of have a, a steady dynamic sand supply, if you will. And you can see that it's very well behaved that yes, it has uh, these retreats after the El Ninos, but then it recovers rather consistently when you fit a trend line to it at about a meter per year after each El Nino. And you can see the 2016 El Nino was a particularly strong one. And so the setback was uh, stronger than normal. Uh, uh, and so it's, uh, the width is not back to what it was in the early 2000s. Um, so we'll see if it makes it back before the next El Nino occurs. Well, the good news is that all of the state beaches uh, south of the San Alijo Lagoon Inlet, so Cardiff State Beach, Torrey Pines North and South, Silver Strand, and Borderfield, they all have shown, they all show positive trends in beach recovery since 2016 when you put them all on the plot like we have here. Um, Cardiff has the steep slopes that uh, of four meter per year recovery. You can see down at the bottom here, this dark purple one, that's North Border Field. So that's um, north of the inlet. And um, you can see that that has had uh, some periods of very strong growth. We believe that was the benefit of the nourishment in Imperial Beach, that sand making its way down to the inlet. Um, and in the story map here, it, it talks a little about each of, the, each of those other um, state beaches that have uh, been recovering. But then finally, the bad news is that north of San Alijo Lagoon Inlet, uh, the state beaches, so now we're talking about San Julio, Moonlight, Lucadia, South Carlsbad, and Carlsbad State Beach, um, they have been doing the opposite since 2016. So this is, should be a recovery period, 
but instead uh, they have all been retreating. Uh, their annual beach width is getting smaller each year uh, on average uh, rather than larger. We don't know why this is happening. Uh, we suspect it's sand supply related. So the 2016 El Nino significantly reduced the sand supply in some way up, up to the north. And uh, so the beaches um, uh, are not recovering and going the other way, but we really don't understand what's happening there. So finally, uh, and that really, this, this is the main, like I say, the kind of the main summary plot on the report, but now it's sort of kind of built it out slowly for people to understand what's there. And then this final section is just now takes people into uh, a way to go look at the different um, state beaches in the report. And so as you go to each one, as you scroll down, it moves along the coastline, and then you can click if you want and, and uh, go look at the report. Um, all the way up, South Carlsbad State. It's actually a, a nice handy map on this side. And in fact, interestingly, by, this is Batiquitos Lagoon. And just so happens this photo has captured uh, some sand bypassing going on. So this is a dredge in, in uh, Batiquitos Lagoon. It looks like they're dumping, putting the sand on the beach to the south side. Have no idea when this occurred, but it's probably in the sand egg report somewhere. Um, so yes, that is what the story map is composed of. And uh, we'd love to get your feedback on whether you find it helpful or, or uh, things that you would like to, to see in it or better explained. Um, and uh, what we've done here certainly uh, is applicable to other state beaches. Um, clearly, we have a lot more data for Torrey Pines and, and Cardiff State Beach in particular than, than many others, but you'll see other state beaches in here mostly just have uh, historical uh, airborne LIDAR in them and things like that. So you can also look at kind of more data starved locations um, and uh, think about how uh, this might be applied in other areas. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Bill. We have time for questions. Well, Bill, I have about three days worth of questions for you. Can I come? Can I come camp out? I knew you would, Darren. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, this is this is fantastic. I'm. It's, this is a, a question I've always had. So we managed the Los Penasquitos Inlet and we bypassed, you know, 25 or 30,000 cubic yards a year. And we mostly put it in the near shore. And I've always been curious what the whole coastline looks like because, you know, I've suspected that a lot of our beach dynamics are kind of managed. You know, we, we do this all the way through. One of the questions is you show kind of an upward trend from the annual beach bypass and in beach widths. And I was curious about that because typically we try to remove mostly what the last season pushed into the inlet. So I've always assumed it was kind of about a, you know, just the same amount came in, goes out every year. Um, do you think that increase is, is due to the bigger nourishment projects or do you think there's a little bit more sediment coming out than, than going in? Yeah, I, I don't know, Darren, I really don't. Um, I, do, I do wonder, I mean, I, I do think that this, this sand bypassing maybe could be done a little more efficiently than it is. Um, uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's a great thing. I think it's actually a very important thing that um, to the sand budgets that, that has not been fully appreciated. At the same time, and I'll speak to Cardiff, is you know that they place the sand just to the south of the inlet, and I think in maybe like six meters depth, which then becomes five meters depth when they're done or something like that. But um, but they do it in the springtime, you know, and and transport is generally to the north in the summer, and we see the way that that beach rocks seasonally. Um, in fact, I'll go to make I can go. I'm into the report here, so let's let's go there. Let's go to Cardiff. One of the things that I didn't show was 
a seasonal uh, beach seasonal volume change map. So this is this is Cardiff, this is San Alijo Lagoon Inlet, and this is showing on average over many years, ten years of data, what's the difference between the kind of like the mean summer elevation in the in the winter, and so this is erosion of the summer put out into a um, bar in the winter time, but you can see different areas that seem to be kind of pockets that kind of rock back and forth, it seems. And this little red thing over here, that's where they tend to dump sand and it kind of shows up as a thing because they keep doing it every year. So it has actually made itself its way into the statistics. But if this is what's happening is if it's just like rocking, so it, it rodes to the south in the winter offshore and then comes back onward and northward in the summer. See, if you put the sand here, you're probably fighting yourself a fair amount that in fact, they put it here. Yes, some of it comes back, but it's like probably getting back into the inlet again with the south swells that in fact, if this was displaced uh, further down or actually if it was put there, I know this seems kind of maybe counterintuitive, but if you put it there in the fall, so in the winter time, it got like shoved farther down the coast. Um, yes, you wouldn't maybe see the immediate benefit of it in the summertime the way you do now, but in terms of feeding the system in a way that you're not kind of cleaning the same sand out of there every year, it may work a little better. And that may be true at other places as well. But yeah, placing things just to the south in the springtime is actually kind of, you're kind of swimming upstream against what the, the uh, sand movement is. Um, but that being said, I think that it has been, huge, you know, what does get to the south and then stays to the south uh, has been very important. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Brad Cray, Cray in the um, chat. Love the story map. Would like to know if they can contribute additional content to it. Um, and they also have a um, virtual 360 VR tour, including zero, 360 slots at San Alejo. So cool. Open to that, Bill. Yes. And, you know, we don't have to get, everything doesn't have to be within one story map. We can use it to kind of lead to more detailed things to take people to other things. Um, uh, but I do think talking about things uh, at an annual basis and moving out from there, both forward and backwards, you know, to shorter time scales and longer time scales uh, makes a lot of sense. All right. Um, let's see, while I hope he's still here, Dr. Guza, are you still here? Bill, would you show the Torrey Pines uh, South, I guess it is, annual beach width? Torrey Pines South. Yes. Seasonal Just, beach, yeah. Yeah. Seasonal beach width. Oh, you want to go to the, the uh, yeah. This one? Yeah, how about Torrey Pines North? Yeah, okay. Here's a sad story. <laughs> this is the story of Torrey Pines North, and it's kind of in a slide in terms of its beach width. As you can see, it was as much as 70 meters wide uh, in 2001. And it's just been kind of gradually decreasing. And some of those blue dots that you see in winter, where the beach is 30 meters wide, there's hardly any beach at high tide. Uh, it's just kind of the waves are knocking into the uh, riprap. So the comment here is that the data set is long enough to be able to detect a slow trend. This is probably lack of sediment. That's probably why this thing is sliding. It's even without sea level rise, it's because the sediment has been cut off by cliff armoring and river damming. And this is the consequence of that. Okay, anyway, at least we know what it's doing. Right. And if, if you do, so if you go back to this 
Beach Report main map. And so he, we've been talking about North Torrey Pines here, the green stars. See, this is the thing, well, it kind of, it was nourished back here, went downhill or whatever, but but here you can see it paralleling South Torrey Pines, our well-behaved beach, yeah. right? But now, but now it drops down and it's like lower, you know, it's just, it's going downhill and that's the multi uh, El Nino cycle trend thing, right? That I was showing that it's just kind of heading downhill. Uh, while South Torrey Pines, that doesn't seem to be necessarily the case that in fact, it, it wants to kind of maintain some sort yeah. of beach width here. But North Torrey Pines, you're right. It seems to be slowly just kind of fading away. Do you, do you think um, one of the, I mean, I don't know if it's a little bit of a controlled beach because we, you know, we put about 25,000 cubic yards in the near shore there every year with the inlet, but we haven't had a, any kind of significant beach nourishment, you know, large scale right. thing there in a long time. Right. That, and, that and then I've always kind of understood there's a little bit more energy in that area than some of the other parts of the coast nearby. I'm wondering if that's what's what's working there. Uh, that's correct. That the farther south you go in general, the more energetic the beaches go, the more exposed they are. Um, yeah, I don't know why the the Cardiff um, bypasses. Uh, I don't think I don't know if they ever put it on the beach. Maybe they do, um, but uh, I don't know why those seem to be a little more effective. Cardiff is almost like a pocket beach with with the with the very pronounced reefs up, but the north and north and south ends, you know, um, and Torrey Pine certainly gets reefier south of Penasquitos Lagoon, but it doesn't have the the Cardiff-like reef on the north side. I don't know if that plays into it a little bit, but but certainly it, it's interesting to me that that the Cardiff bypasses seem seem at least sand budget wise to have been very effective, and uh, Torrey Pines not as much so. Um, so yeah, it's worth looking at what are the differences between those specifically, uh, when they're done, how often they're done, where the sand is placed. Ron, did you want to share your question? Oh yeah, uh, sure. Uh, you know, when when you uh, when you uh, look at decreases in beach width or sand volume at Torrey Pines. Uh, you know, my first thought is uh, because of the type of, of cliff sediment uh, and the height of those things, um, and the, the fact that you know, I've always thought that the uh, major source of sand at uh, Torrey Pines uh, has been cliff erosion. Uh, you know, we've had massive uh, cliff failures there. You know, uh, relatively rare, but massive failures over the last you know 40 years. Where uh, they can put, you know, 50 to 100 cubic yards of sand on the beach, you know, in in, in three minutes when during the during the fall. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is uh, if if you've already done this, uh, uh, you know, combine the lidar data, uh, which goes back to uh, what 2008 now, I guess. What was the first lidar survey at Torrey Pines? Combine the lidar surveys of the cliff retreat at Torrey Pines with the uh, with the measured um, shoreline retreat and see if there's been an actual decrease in the amount of sand coming out of the out of the cliffs there uh, over the last 20 years. I think that's probably the first thing you know that I would look at rather than trying to make a connection. And and I put it the other way from what Bob said, uh, putting that question the other way. Uh, you know, there's always been this wonderment about the longshore sediment transport and the so-called literal cells, right, that extend in this case from Dana Point to Oceanside, through Oceanside to, to, uh, to Point La Jolla, um, you know, is, is, it's a nice conceptual idea, but uh, the specific question here is, uh, is the Torrey Pine sediment budget actually connected to what's going on in North County uh, and the seawalls there? Uh, you know, my feeling has always been no, but maybe that's wrong. Uh, maybe the, uh, you know, maybe it is connected to, to the lack of sediment uh, due to armoring of North County. And that would, uh, you know, that would be a really important contribution if we could sort that out. Any other comments? Um... Switching gears a little bit, Marina and Nick on the line here are 
um, graduate students who are working on this from the science point of view, but they're also very interested in, you know, what this means, what's the societal benefit of some of this work. And so they're very interested in seeing how the, to translate this into um, meaningful products and to potentially policy issues. And so if there's um, potential for parks to work with the students on those kinds of things, I think they'd be very open to that. We also have a climate science and policy master's program at Scripps. And a lot of those students have, they're only here for a year, but they do a, a capstone project. And um, I know several of them are interested in working on state parks related projects. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of interest in that. You know, I think that um, following this call, which I hope will prompt some, you know, some thinking and some discussion here internally at parks, we could try to, you know, figure out how to fit, you know, different needs to maybe the right um, students and, you know, figure out what might make sense for, for a project. I mean, certainly there's a lot that can be done um, in interpretation. We have a whole interpretation and education division. Um, we could also talk to the, the district natural resources and scientist staff to see, you know, kind of what their needs and interests could be. So yeah, I think that would be great. We've even toyed, you know, with the idea of some kind of, um, you know, some workshop or something like that to try to kind of connect the dots. I think with COVID, it's a little harder to figure out how that might work, but um, maybe we can figure out something that could be remote. Um, and we will be, you know, hiring uh, the new um, senior environmental specialist uh, slash oceanographer to take over management of this program soon. And so, you know, I think that we'll have more bandwidth to do more coordination and you know, matchmaking between um, different uh, folks at parks and, and you all. So this is exciting. Thank you for doing this, all of you. Um, I see, Jeff, I don't know if you're still on the line there, Jeff Crooks, but I just wanted to bring to your attention that we're also starting to look at uh, groundwater issues and water level changes in the estuary. So. Um, um, hoping to work with you on that in the future. And yeah, yeah, that sounds great. I saw some emails about drilling some wells out there. That'll be really important. Getting a handle on the groundwater is a really big deal. So yeah, we're trying to sort help sort that out. Great. Okay, maybe I'll just end with a reminder of why we're doing all this. This is for the public benefit. And so, um, you know, we're looking for ways to um, make this as, uh, you know, direct benefits for the public as possible, so. Is this you, Mark? No, I don't, I don't know, is this, uh, this looks like, maybe, was it from those ads? Is this like the, uh, is that suntan lotion baby? I don't know who this is. Any <laughs> the pre-copper tone. You, 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 you wise guy, Mark. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is me at Whitestone Beach at the beginning of my, my in New York and beginning of my shoreline processes career at age three, about six months after we emigrated from Germany, where they don't have beaches, uh, it's only ice. Um, you know, they have in Germany you have six months winter and six months cold, uh, the other way around. Um, but so that's was this was a. Uh, big eye opener for me and got me started on my career. So thanks for showing that, Mark. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. So um, we'll be available if you want to uh, continue any of the discussion going forward. Um, otherwise, we really appreciate you taking a couple hours of your day to sit with us and we're open to all, um, any feedback you have going forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark, and to everyone who contributed and made presentations today. I learned a lot, and it's really exciting, cutting-edge stuff. Thank you, everybody. All right. Yes, thank you. This is great. Thank you, everybody. And, and again, please you know, send me emails and, and route through me if um, any of the parks folks want to get in contact with the researchers. Um, 
you know, happy, happy to be that facilitator. Thank you, Nick.